It's crazy how many doors we walk through each and every day. A lot of us walk through dozens and dozens of doors. I'm talking about bedroom doors, bathroom doors, front doors, back doors, revolving doors. There are doors everywhere. And again, reflexively, almost intuitively, we just walk through doors. Well, today I am talking about a door. Many of us, if you're here or watching online, many of us are going through the Bible, the chronological Bible. The Bible is truly the open door, literally the open door to life. The Bible tells you and me about our destiny. It tells us about God, about ourselves, about others. It teaches us about everything from relationships to our career, emotions, everything is in God's word. So today we are going to talk about the door that, that we're opening as we read through the chronological Bible. If you've not done that yet, if you're not involved in it yet, you can, can, can pick a chronological Bible up and read through it because over the next, believe it or not, year, are you ready for that? Year, we're going to unpack the Bible. Now, obviously, I can't speak on every text, on every story, on every detail that we read. I hope you know that. I am, however, going to hit the high points and bring out some things prayerfully that, that you've never seen before or never thought about before. Because the Bible, in, in, in one sentence, is about Jesus. Let me say that again. The Bible is about the Son of God. Everything in this book points to Jesus. Right now, we're going through the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and then we'll segue into the New Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Today, I thought about talking about the most read verse in Scripture. I'm going to talk about that verse that more people have read than any other verse of Scripture. I would say people have read this text more than any text in the history of literature. I mean, how many people have said, okay, I'm going to read through the Bible. And we start in the book of Genesis, and then after a while we get all caught up in the begats and the begots, and it begins to read like a Hebrew telephone directory, and we're like, I'm done. I tried it, and I don't understand it, so I'm done with the Bible. Well, everyone who's ever tried to read the Bible, at least, at least you've gotten to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. <laughs> and that is what we're going to talk about, because that verse, that text, listen to me now, is the key to the entire Bible. Let me say it again. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is the foundation of the entire Bible. What does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sounds sort of, you know, straightforward. You might think, oh, that sounds theologically benign. No big deal. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. God, Elohim, it's a plural noun. It refers to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't it incredible that Jesus is mentioned in the first verse of the Bible? Later on, the Bible says, when talking about God making man, let us make man in our image. Again, the plural, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, one in three. There's no way our little pea brains can understand the power of the Trinity. It's like to dumb it down, you have a pie and you slice the pie into three pieces. They're individual, yet they're one, so, so that is the, is the vibe, but God is one. There's perfect synchronization, perfect harmony. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. 
Let me see. I'm going to do something fun. Let me see. Let me see. Who can I pick on? I'll pick on my lovely daughter, Lee Beth. Lee Beth, come here for a second. Come here. Just come up. This is Lee Beth. <laughs> now, I'm going I'm to pick someone that I don't know. I mean, I might have met you or seen you, but let's just pick someone that, 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 I, that I don't know. Um, wow, I know everyone. <laughs> it's amazing. How about you, young lady in the purple sweater? Purple's my favorite color. I'm sure we've met before. Come on up. I'm sure we've met before, but just help me, okay? You know, how are you doing? Tell me your name. Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Have we met before? Yes. Well, <laughs> huh? You know her too. Okay. This example is falling apart, but that's okay. Lauren, you're, you're nice and tall. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. It's great to be tall. Did you know that? Did you know we're going to find out? Check this out. Some of the, some of the most influential matriarchs and patriarchs in scripture were tall. I'm not saying it's bad if you're not tall, if you're shorter. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that, okay? Anyway, okay. Lauren, right? Okay. Okay, let's say that Lauren and I are talking and we're out in the lobby and, and hey, Lauren, how are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. We're talking. And let's say Lee Beth's over there. Lee Beth, you, you, you kind of stand over there. Okay. So we're talking, you know, you know, about A, B, and C or whatever, blah, 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 blah. And then I see out of the corner of my eye, my daughter, one of four children, our oldest, you know, the favorite child. Don't tell your, <laughs> don't tell your siblings that. So I would look, if Lee Beth comes walking up, walk up, stop, okay. I would look and go, Lee Beth? I want you to meet Lauren. Lauren, this is our daughter and a phenomenal young lady, Lee Beth. That's what I would do. Please do that. Please introduce yourself and learn how to introduce your friends, people you know, to others. It's very important. I just described to you what the writer of Genesis did in Genesis chapter one, verse one. He didn't, he didn't try to prove God. You see, God is above proof. You can't prove God. He didn't try to argue his case. He was just simply saying, hey, I want you to meet God. God is, I mean, Lee Beth is. So that's what we have going on in Genesis chapter one, verse one. Lauren, thank you very much, <laughs> Lee Beth. I was talking to a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago who's an agnostic. And he said, Ed, just prove God. I said, I can't prove God. I said, I can't. I said, God's above proof. I said, you can't prove there is no God. So see, God's above that. Now, I'm not saying that there are no evidences for God. Obviously, there are evidences. We don't, though, prove God. It's like we discovered and we discover these scientific laws, laws of nature, laws of physics. Scientists don't create them, they just discover them. And sometimes people get all hung up about science. Does science and the Bible go hand in hand? The Bible doesn't need science to prop it up. Science is playing catch up with God. So true Bible and true science always Complement one another. We have to understand though, God was there, is there, will be there forever and ever. So in the beginning, God, the beginner of the beginning, the unmade maker, God. So the writer is going like, okay, here's God, and, and, and God simply opens the door and he begins to reveal himself to us. So that's a dynamic, isn't it? Introduction. But notice something else I want you to see in this first verse. Look at the dynamic construction of the deal. The Bible says again, Genesis chapter one, verse one, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This word created is the Hebrew word bara. It's only referred to in terms of God. God is creating out of nothing. When I create or when you create, we have to have something, right, to, to utilize, some, some tools, some materials to create. Well, in the beginning, God created out of nothing. And this word is ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. Seven times in the book of Genesis. God said, God said, God said, God said, God said. God spoke the world into existence. No one understands that. You can't explain that. It's not like you can go, wow, okay. But, but, but we know that God's word is so powerful. Think about this. That he spoke this creation into existence. And we have an opportunity, do we not? To read his written word. That's how powerful it is. Jesus was even called the Word. In the book of John, the Word became flesh, God's Word. The book of 1 Timothy says that God's Word is breathed. It's literally the breath of God. In the original language, it's theonoustos. <sighs> he breathed his Word on numerous writers of Scripture as they penned this holy book. But, but, but the whole thing hinges, I'm, I'm telling you now, the whole thing hinges on, on this text. Your life and mine hinges on this text because it's either design or accident. It's either by random choice or it's intentional. That's the issue. It's not uh, when God created the world in seven days, are those seven literal 24 hour days or are they 24 billion years? You can chase that rabbit all day long. The, the, the net effect at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it is creation or we're just kind of an accident at the end of the day. Don't you love to hear people use business speak? You're not going to laugh very much because you use it. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we love to say that, don't we? What are the optics of the situation? Well, the narrative is, and let me pivot. Oh, there's a lot of hair on that deal. <laughs> business speak. So I thought I would throw in some business speak. And guys are the ones that, we, we, we think that's really cool to talk that way. At the end of the day, it comes down to what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about what God's talking about. It's either by design or by accident. So if it is by design, stay with me now. If it's by design, I'm made in the image of God. I just quoted Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I have a purpose, a plan, there's power, and there's eternity, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There's real meaning in my life. I'm one of a kind, I am unique. After all, I have a green jacket on. And I like green, I don't care if you don't like it, I just like it, I'm, I'm unique. But if I'm an accident, if I'm a product of bioptic soup, well, I've heard, I've heard some people say that, some evolutionists say that, we're just from bioptic soup. I, I go, stop, who made the gumbo? Because if we're here by chance, we're pretty much gonna act like animals. We're just amped up algae. We're spawning Salmon, we're dogs in heat. We're here, if, if, if we're here just by chance, to fornicate, recreate, and then we finally disintegrate. And as we look at our culture, 
we see people acting like animals. The reason? They've been taught by Dr. Fuzzy Face for decades. You are an animal. Because all of the Dr. Fuzzy Faces, they buy into Darwinism. And Charles Darwin was a card-carrying racist. I hope you know that. Do any research on him. And they just teach it, the theory of evolution, as fact. It's not fact. I mean, there are a lot of problems with evolution, the transmigration of the species, question mark, the second law of thermodynamics, question mark, the morality question. I could go on and on, but I'm not here to do some scientific lecture on creation versus evolution. But what I'm here to tell you is God made you. God made the world. And it doesn't take someone really bright to discover that. In fact, we have to learn to, to, to be an evolutionist. We're, we're, we're born with this eternity, the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, set in our heart. Look what Dr. Paul Dottie said from Harvard University. Our bodies are made up of 30 trillion cells. Every one of those cells are more complicated than New York City, and hopefully they're in much better shape than New York City. <laughs> Sir Frederick Hoyle, an expert on the origin of the universe, writes, believing life could result from chance is like believing a tornado could sweep through a junkyard and the winds accidentally assemble a fully functioning Boeing 747. People that turn their backs on creation, on design, have a vested interest in keeping God out of their stuff. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, a fool says there is no God. The word fool is not an intellectual term, it's a behavioral term. People really don't have any intellectual problems with what I'm talking about. They have behavioral problems on what I'm talking about. We don't want God in our stuff, man. We don't want him there, so we, we just have a vested interest in keeping him away. It's, it's a worldview situation. Creation, or we're here by accident. When our worldview is inverted, things definitely get perverted, don't they? Think about it. I've written down some things. When a man pretends to be a woman, we're supposed to play make-believe with him. Perverted. We can't lie to Congress, but Congress can lie to us to make us lie. Perverted. We can kill developing babies, that's okay, but we have to protect the eggs of sea turtles. Pro athletes and actors and actresses, some of the most immoral people in the world lecture us about morality? Everything's inverted. Oh, Marxism is so sexy now, but Marxism has murdered 110 million people. We talk about freedom of speech and everything is cool and everything is fine, yet at every turn, certain groups are censoring us. They talk about tolerance and they're tolerant if you talk their language, but the moment you step up and stand up, especially for the things of God, for absolute truth, boom, you're censored. It's more beneficial in our culture to have a baby out of wedlock and marry the government than it is to get married. And blame is better today than responsibility. So we have to see the implications, friends, of 
of this situation. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Like, like if, it's, if it's designed, if I'm created, if God spoke it into existence, I'm going to behave and live one way. I'm going to see the world one way. But if I go, you know what, I'm, I'm going to reject that, and I go the other way, then after a while we go down the proverbial rabbit hole of rebellion and absurdity. And that's what we're seeing in real time right now. Let me go back to the creation. Genesis chapter one, verse two. I think this is a, a, a very fascinating text. So God is, you know, he's, he's, he's creating and it says in, in verse two of Genesis chapter one, now the earth was formless and empty darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God began to do his, to do his work in his creation. That was God's first creation. Well, the first creation and the first Adam had some trouble, didn't they? Because I wanna address the diabolical destruction. Man and woman had an open door policy with God. God made them in his image and everything was flowing. God said though, don't touch the fruit on the tree in the middle of the garden. So to give you the cliff notes, Adam and Eve tried to find their own door to God. And the Bible called this behavior sin. I think it's humorous, it's kind of an aside in your readings. When, when, when man sinned, they played a couple of games. Number one, they played a cosmic game of hide and seek. And then they played the blame game. Adam blamed Eve and he blamed Adam, then they blamed the serpent and he didn't have a leg to stand on. So <laughs> the blame game has been in effect for a long, long time. Sin literally slammed the door shut. Slammed the door in God's face. A barrier now. And this is, this is set up in the book of Genesis. In all of our readings, we're going to see this foreshadowing. A barrier between God and man. God saw this door dilemma, and he could have said, you know what, I'm done. For eternity, I'm gonna shut you out. But notice this, God created you and me. And because of that, think about this, we have a responsibility to God, we're obligated to God, but also, and I don't mean to speak out of turn, God is obligated to us. Now obviously, it's our choice, just like God had a freedom of choice to create or not, this door dilemma, though, was serious. And all creation held its breath to see what was God going to do about this door dilemma. And then we see a picture of the door. As we've read, because of sin, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, and he placed a couple of angels at the door of the eastern entrance to the garden. And these angels represent grace and mercy. Huh. Foreshadowing. And, and then we have, from Adam and Eve, we have Cain and Abel. The first homicide was committed over a tithe. So it started getting crazy, didn't it? And then it started getting so crazy, God said, I'm gonna destroy the earth. Yet he spared Noah and his family. And then because of that, you have characters like Abraham, the father of our faith. God initiated a covenant with him. And then you have Lot. I mean, Lot was definitely, definitely wheels off. His whole scenario with, with Sodom and Gomorrah. So you have the sinfulness of man. You see, though, God picturing and talking about the door. 
God, for example, brought up the door when the children of Israel were, were, were getting emancipated from slavery. What did God say? Take the blood of the lamb and apply it to the door. And then after that, God set up worship, the tabernacle, and, and it was all about the door to the holy of holy. So we're going to see this in our reading, the foreshadowing, the door, the door, the door. Then Jesus announced during his 36-month public ministry in John chapter 10, verse 9, he said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved, he'll go in and out and find pasture. How incredible is God? So the door was open. Man sinned and slammed the door shut. God began to foreshadow the door as he progressively revealed himself to people. Then we have Jesus saying, I am the door. And then in Revelation chapter three, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, Jesus said, I'll come into you. It was God's choice, his initiative, his will to do all of this. We're made in his image. We have a will. We either open the door and invite Christ in or not. God wants to create in your life a new creation. In the first creation, the first Adam messed up. But in this new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The first Adam messed up the first creation. The second Adam, Jesus, is all about the new creation. If you're away from Christ, your life is empty and void, and the Spirit of God is moving over your life. All you have to do is open the door of your heart, and Christ will come in, and you will be, my friend, a new creation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power and the priority of your word. God, there's so many things in it that are just mysterious. So many things that we'll never understand. But I thank you for the gift of faith that you've given all of us. And I pray for this faith journey as we, as we walk in your word and discover what you have for us. I know, God, there, there are many people who are here at our various locations. Maybe you're gonna watch this on television one day or maybe you're online. And it's your time to open the door of your life. Remember, Jesus is knocking on the door of your life. He's knocking through situations, through good times and through bad times, through a relationship. And maybe it's time. Maybe today is the time where you say, Lord, I open my life up to you. I open the door of my life to you. Once you say that with me, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, just say, God, I admit to you that I am a sinner and I need you, Jesus. I believe literally you are the door and you're knocking on the door. And at this moment, Jesus, come into my life. I open the door of my life. You come in and take everything. 
I turn from my sins and turn to you, Jesus. I give my life to you. If you said that prayer, that's the best decision that you'll ever make. And the Lord right now has created in you a new creation, and that is Jesus. We voice this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.